Okay, um, so we're doing this process, we're doing this process, record the call, then you pause the recording, stop the recorder, and then this is where herpetology um, has its advantage over, over um, people who record um, bird song, is that then we can put the recorder down quickly and grab the frog. We catch the frog and then we can collect some data from it and get those data associated with the call. So you catch the frog and then you record, and in this case you write in your field notes and then you, re you read the data into your recording, the actual recording segment, the air temperature before and after the call, the temperature of the object that the frog was sitting on, the perch, or if the frog was in the water, you record the water temperature. Um, you record the temperature, the body temperature of the frog by using these small thermometers and, and inserting into the cloaca of the frog, and I'll show you. The temp whoops, the temperature after, after the recording. Other notes, like is this a territorial call or is it an advertisement call, or if you have any indication about social behavior, um, what's going on. Or you might want to record, as I just pointed out, that instance of other frogs calling in the background and the identity of those frogs if you know what they are. All that information, you can read it, you can speak it right into recording, and then that recording segment has a complete record of all the information that would go with that frog call, the social information, the locality, the date, the time, your name, everything. And then if someone, years from now, only has that 30 second recording, they can get every bit of data that they need from inside the recording itself. It's just like putting the tag in the photograph with the frog. That picture will have all the information with it. Okay, and then what I like to do after you've done all this, you've, you've taken the information, is do, we, we did an intro where we read the informa information into the call at the beginning, and then we do an outro, or whatever you want to call it. Something where you read all the complete data, all that information in again at the end of the call, which is a kind of backup, and it self-corrects for time and things like that. Okay. So, um, which data are recorded where, and here's um, me repeating some of my stuff, but the data are read verbally into the, the recall segment in the intro and the outro. Each recording segment then has all the individual data for each of the individual species. That's super important. I just can't emphasize enough how much I want to see all the data within the recording segment of each call. Um, and then um, the field notebooks, you write down all this information into your notebook that you're carrying around with you in the field, and that data will be transcribed the next day into your catalog. You'll write down the identity of the person recording, and again, this format that I like is to have numbered recordings for yourself on a particular date, and then when you put that into your catalog, all you have to write down is RMB recording number three, because you've already at the top of the page said this is the 11th of August, 2008, or whatever. Um, here again, you can put the numbers of your field tags in the bag with it, so that every single frog has that unique identifier and never becomes separated from it. And then you take the temperatures, before and after, the perch temperature, the leaf, the water temperature, the frog temperature, etc. So I put all this in here, again, just to back it up and so that you have all the information when you take this lecture with you. Um, you can refer back to this if this interests you. So what else? So all the data are read back and forth into, into the call recording itself. And thus, each recording segment has, for each individual frog, all the data that are associated with it, complete data with every recording. I love that. And then, what you want to do is back everything up a bunch of times. I can't tell you how many times I've lost data because I come back from my trip, and that one cassette tape, this shows you how old I am, that cassette tape got lost, and I have 20 cassette tapes instead of 21, and I don't know where that other one went, and I lost data. Um, or I, backed, I had it on my computer, and my laptop crashed or I had it on a flash drive and I lost the flash drive. So just back it up, right? The, the thing about digital data is that you can make three or four copies of it and then email something home or put it on a disk and send it to yourself or give a flash drive to your friend and tell them to keep it at their house while you keep your data at your house. Just back it up and spread it out to, pres to protect you against the inevitable disasters that fall befall us when it comes to digital data in one place. You only have to learn that lesson once and have, lose a life, of, or a, a, hopefully not a lifetime, but lose a couple months of work, and you only have to learn, have that experience once or twice before you'll never do it again. So um, take my advice here. Okay, again, I mentioned before that the eventual analyses of these calls will, must, they, the, the calls can't really be um, statistically compared to other recordings of other species unless you have the temperature information. The temperatures are really important, and so many people record frogs and bring the recordings to me and ask me what species it is, and if I knew, if they could tell me that it was at 25 degrees versus 18 degrees, I could tell them what species it is, because a lot of frogs differ in how fast they call, and warm frogs call faster. 
So you need to have that temperature information. So if it was a hot night, the frog is going to be calling really fast. And you heard some examples of the super fast frequency sweep calls in the background. But on a slow night, that frog might sound completely different. Um, so we must have the temperature, quality temperature data associated with every recording se segment. And so here's an example. Imagine um, complete data recorded, and you get a nice recording segment for an individual, and then the recordist pauses, puts the recorder down to catch the frog, and this happens like way too many times, and the frog escapes. You know, 25% of the frogs we go after, or maybe 50%, escape, and we try to grab them, and they jump away. So then you don't have the frog, and you spent 20 minutes re getting the recording and writing down all the temperatures, so what do you do? You know, you lost half the data. You don't have the temperatures. You don't have the individual specimen. You know, do you erase the recording that you did and start over? I used to do that. But you can also, um, you know, you can salvage the situation with, with some missing data. With a knowledge of the air temperature, for example, and a knowledge of the frog temperatures for other individuals in that same population, um, we can use regression equation to estimate a frog temperature. And this serves, this saves us from having to discard the data. So here's just an example of how, if you have some of the data, you can recreate some of the other data. With a knowledge of that air temperature, so here are some, so for, for one species of frog, and I've recorded 15 individuals of that frog, here's the relationship between the, sorry, the, re, the air temperature that I recorded and the frog temperature for all of those individuals. And on the, tw on the 16th try, I tried to record a frog, and I got the air temperature, and I recorded it, and the frog escaped. And with this equation, you know, this line here, this regression analysis, has an equation that corresponds to this, this fit of this line through the data. And with that equation, I can extrapolate from the air temperature and get the frog body temperature. And once we have the frog body temperature, then I can statistically compare this to um, other frogs, other species. So you can salvage the situation if you get some of the data and if you stay in a very, very organized way. OK. So here's an example of a filled in sheet. And the point I wanted to make was that, so here is, you know, we've recorded the year, the species identity. It was March 9th on uh, 2015 when Dave Blackburn uh, recorded this frog. And then I wrote here in the special field, RMB recording number 13. And so we know that that's the 13th frog that was recorded on March 9th in 2015. And in the, in the bag with the frog, I either wrote the number 13 on a little piece of paper and threw it in there, or I put the tag in with the frog. And so all the data are connected up. And nothing is lost or de decoupled. OK. I'm just going to leave that up there. And for this final part, I'm just going to go around and show you how I would actually do one of these, fo these frog recordings. And uh, some of the folks back there look like they need me to come around and, and wake them up by sticking this microphone in their face. So, OK. So let's say I'm going to turn it on here, turn on my microphone, and turn on my recorder. And I've got my field notebook and my thermometer. And what else do I need? Field notebook, thermometer, a good pen that you can write on in the rain, or a pencil. So you can write if it's wet, because often when the frogs are calling, it's raining outside. So um, do you need a microphone or anything? OK. So I've got my, my thermometer. Didn't break. And uh, I'm going to go out, turn my microphone on. And as I, let's say I hear a frog calling down here in a pond over here. So as I'm going, I go ahead and turn my microphone on and say, this is Rafe Brown. It is um, August 11th, 2008 at 9 PM. I'm in Cameroon. We're in southwestern province. Korup National Park, 300 meters above sea level. It's 9 p.m. I hear a frog calling in a small pond. About seems like it's 20 meters from me today. Um, it has been raining every day for the la in the afternoon for the last couple for the last week. This is the beginning of the rainy season. Um, this area has six or eight different species of frogs. I refer to my field note, my field notes for the identities. I think I hear Hylorana albolabris calling, and so I'm going to try to approach this frog and turning off my light and just tell the story. I mean, you, you know, I used, my advisor used to tell me tape is cheap. Of course, we don't use tape anymore. But digital media are re relatively cheap. So just tell, speak into your microphone and tell the, tell the whole story of, the, of, the, of the, everything that might be biologically relevant to the frog. So you're walking through the forest, and you're going to say, um, yep, it sounds like there's albolabris Alba calling over here, hylorana. And I think I hear 10 individuals. And there's two species of Hyperolius calling in the background, Hyperolius petersoni and Hyperolius blackburni. And uh, so I'm approaching now. I'm five meters away from the four meters away from the pond, 
and uh, uh, t attempting to record Hylorana albolabris. This is RMB, and the last thing you say before you record, this is RMB recording number 13, or number 3, for the 11th of August, 2008. Recording number 1, or recording number 3. And then you stand there and slowly record this, turn off your light, and usually when you approach a bunch of frogs with your light on, they get quiet. So you turn off your light, and you may want to pause it and wait for them to start calling again, so you're not just burning, burning tape on silence. But eventually you get to the point where you hear them starting up again, and you go over and you record them, and you point your microphone directly at one, and you want to be about two to three meters away from it. You don't want to get too close, because then the frog's volume is too loud for the recording and overshoots the over, what we call clips recording, or it overpowers the input recording capacity of the microphone. And you don't want to be too far away so that you hear other off-axis sounds or the, call, um, the signal of the call recording is too quiet and very soft in the microphone. So you want to get close to it. And then the, the thing you have to do with these microphones is be adjusting the input, um, the recording volume, so that you're not over-recording you know, into the red. Of you, you all have a sense of what that means like the mic with a recorder. You're not recording into the red where it's, it's overpowering the capacity of the recorder. And you're not recording with the volume, the input volume so low that you can't really hear it. So you do that, you record, you have one individual, you record it at 25 times. And then I'm going to um, uh, put the unit on pause and put everything down and turn on my light and all the frogs stop. And then you run over and try to catch the one frog that you're recording. And let's say I was lucky enough to catch it. And I still have my mic everything on pause, turn my microphone off, put it away, take out my notebook. I've got the frog in my hand. This is an example of like all the different things you have to do. Then you have the frog and you're holding it by the legs because you don't want to hold it with your hand because if you do so, you'll heat up its body temperature with the body temperature of your own body. And then you pull out this little thermometer, this cloacal thermometer that has a really small bulb and it reads very fast. And I hold the frog and insert this inside the frog's cloaca and then look at it really quickly and it says 23 degrees or something. And then I put that away so I won't break it. And I write in my field notebook, Cameroon, you know, the, the full locality data, RMB recording number three for the 4th of March, Hylorana albolabris, frog temperature 23.3. And then I can relax, I put the frog in a bag, I put a tag in there so I know which number it is, it's frog number three for tonight, this date. And I can relax and turn everything off and wait for a second, pull out my recorder again, I record the air temperature and I write in my field notebook TA for air temperature is 22.0. And I might also go over to right where I was, saw the frog and record the temperature of the rock that the frog was, record, was sitting on. And let's say that temperature was 22.5. And so I write all this stuff down into my field notebook. And I put my thermometer away and relax. And so now I have my, in my little field notebook the temperatures, the species, the recording number for tonight. Um, and then I write down in the background all that other stuff. Uh, let's see, the background I heard Hyperoleus blackburni and Hyperoleus petersoni. I write that down. And then I have my field notebook, I put my pen away, and then I turn the recorder back on, it's paused, turn the microphone back on, and then I do the outro. And I go, okay, that was recording number three for the 4th of March, 2008, or 2015. That was Hylorana albolabris, recorded at two to three meters from the microphone in a small pond. You heard the calls of three or four other Hyla albolabris in the background. You could also hear the calls of these two species of Hyperoleus. The complete data for this section are Cameroon, southwestern province, Corrup National Park, 300 meters above sea level. Um, it rained this afternoon. Just tell the whole story again of the whole complete recording segment. And then, um, and then the last thing you say was, that was R&B recording number three for the 11th of August, 2008. Recording number three, stop. And then you can turn everything off. And then the person who has it has all the data in that one couple minute segment. And even if that gets served to another platform or ends up in another collection somewhere, all the data are perfectly associated. And because you did the intro and the outro, the two things, if there's any discrepancies, those discrepancies basically hopefully represent you refining the data. So if you said, as you're approaching the frogs, I think I, I can record this subject number three, um, three meters from the microphone, but as you walked away from the situation, you said that frog was recorded five meters from the microphone, then we know how far you were from the frog by the final thing that you say, right? The, the thing you, if you did a comparison between what you said at the beginning of the recording and a comparison about what you said at the end of the recording, we would probably take the one at the end of the recording with, um, with higher 
probability of having be, being right and correct. And then again, you have all the temperatures associated with it. And of course, if you miss the frog, then you curse into your microphone and say, damn it, that's the fourth frog I, I lost tonight. It got away, but the air temperature was 22.5, and I recorded six other specimens at this site. And we got all their cloacal temperatures, which will enable us to extrapolate the, re the frog temperature for this individual later, at a later date. So you can tell all that information into the microphone. So I hope that just gives you an example. And again, um, this is it's, it's something that's really fun to do, and it's a real challenge to try to get complete data. But you know, the, what we, the exercise we just went through took us a half an hour at least, or 20 minutes to do this around the room. But imagine trying to do that while you're trying to watch for venomous snakes, and there's a bunch of people splashing around in the background, and you just stepped on um, a thorny bush and cut your leg, and um, all the frogs you've been catching tonight escaped, and you're all muddy, and there's mosquitoes all over you. I mean, it's, it can be a real challenge in the field. So sometimes, one person doing recordings could take a whole evening to collect recordings for 10 frogs. So this is another case where it's really good to have some people in the camp running around trying to collect as many individuals as possible, and one or two people really focused on trying to get good, high-quality recordings and collect all the data. And one of the things that can really help you is if you can um, have an assistant while you're doing this who can help you collect the data. You hand them the frog, they take the temperature, Work in a team, it works, it makes all this, keeping all this stuff straight, keeping it all, um, um, all together, and if there's multiple people doing it, they can remind each other if you forget to record the date or the air temperature or something like that. Okay, that was probably more information than most of the people in this room wanted to know, but um, I hope we all get a chance to um, do some of this together in the field, because it is really fun. And once you have all this data, there's all sorts of things you can do with the analysis. And again, a specimen with complete recording data is, is 10 times more valuable when it comes to the analysis than something that's missing data. So I'm going to stop there, and I think it's lunch now.